I want to talk today about Karl Marx. Marx is a philosopher, an economist, a political theorist, also someone who founds uh, a discipline that extends far beyond his own thought, Marxism, something that gets expressed in the political ideologies of a variety of countries throughout the 20th century. Although Marx himself is a 19th century thinker, one of the things that's very important to realize is that his thought shapes in fundamental ways the entire 20th century by partly being implemented in a variety of countries, most notably the Soviet Union and China, uh, but a variety of other smaller countries as well. In addition, it's something that has a significant intellectual impact today. I'm going to stay, say a few words about the intellectual background before we get to Marx's thought directly. In particular, I want to talk about a sort of view that I'll describe as neo-Gnosticism. Um, it's lonely being one of the few who truly knows. Notice there's a similarity between the way that guy looks and Marx. That could almost be Marx on vacation. What I want to talk about is a version of the two-level theory we've been talking about, but something that draws certain social and political implications from it. So in particular, we've talked about the manifest image. We see ourselves as free. We think of ourselves as acting for, region, for reasons. We act rightly or wrongly, virtuously or viciously. We think of ourselves, in short, as rational agents who are capable of making moral decisions and solving practical problems of all kinds, and we take responsibility. Or we evade responsibility, but at least we think of ourselves as the kinds of beings who can rightly be called responsible for our actions. Now, all of that is hard to reconcile with the scientific image. According to that, there's a depth level below that surface level of the manifest image, according to which we're really determined by something we're not even aware of. There is something we're not conscious of that is really shaping what we do, how we think, how we act. Our reasons are really mere rationalizations. The underlying causes are all at this depth level that we aren't aware of. Moreover, morality is therefore either nonsense or it's really something it reduces to something else. It doesn't have any independent, uh, <clears throat> you might say, justification, because everything we're really doing, everything we're uh, uh, putting into action, is shaped by things we're not aware of. So our conscious thoughts, what should we do? Perhaps we should do that. Are there rules like this? What would a virtuous person do? And all, all of that is irrelevant. None of that really determines how we act. Consequently, from this point of view, we're not free agents, we're not rational agents at all. We are really determined entirely by scientific laws, by other things, and so we have no responsibility. We are just tools. We are agents through which, you might say, various impersonal forces act. We don't ourselves consciously have any role as agents at all. Now, it's hard to get those two images together. Sellers challenges philosophy to put them together, essentially saying, look, the scientific image has a lot of justification. The world does seem to consist of particles or fields or waves or what have you that are governed by scientific law, and yet we also think, seem to think of ourselves as free. We can't make any sense of our own identities, our own rationality, our own agency, unless we think of ourselves as rational agents who are capable of solving problems and making choices freely. Well, how do we get these two together? That's a difficult philosophical problem. What politically or socially follows from that distinction? Well, nothing directly at all. From a purely scientific version of this view, nothing follows. Suppose we are really just microparticles that are governed by scientific law. What does that mean about the organization of society? Well, in any obvious way, nothing. Nobody knows, for one thing, and can manipulate these connections. To know that I'm made up of micro microparticles that are governed by physical law doesn't say anything at all about what I should be thinking, or how someone should organize society. In fact, those should questions are really normative and hard to fit into the scientific image at all. But what if we knew the basic level? What if we understood its connections to the surface level? What if it were possible to actually trace out those connections and understand how alterations in whatever the basic level is affect changes in the surface level? What if, in other words, we could manipulate the scientific image, or whatever passes for a scientific image, according to a view, and shape our own conscious reactions, shape the manifest image, and shape what we do. Well, then we can change the surface level by manipulating the base. And that's exactly what a neo-gnostic tries to do. So you might say a two-level theory by itself doesn't have any direct practical implications. But combine a two-level theory with a degree of intellectual hubris, a sort of pride that we actually do understand the base level and understand the connections and can manipulate them. And you can get easily out of this a two-level conception of society. What do I mean by that? Well, 
I really mean what I'm describing as modern Gnosticism here, or neo-Gnosticism. The idea is that there are those who know the underlying causes and can trace the connections. Those are the ones who know, those are the elite, the intellectuals, those who have the required knowledge, and then there are those who don't, the common people, the rest of us. Most people who are acting, thinking that they're free, thinking that they're rational, and in fact not doing that at all, but reflecting these underlying depth level considerations, whatever they happen to be. Well, on that view, you might say, yes, there's some level which really governs the way we act. There is the level of appearance, the manifest image, where we think we're acting, but we're really not. And the Gnostic thinks that he or she is capable of manipulating the upper level by manipulating the base level. If you understand this, if you understand the arrow linking them, then maybe you can transform society by making changes in the base level. Well, that leads neo-Gnostics to think that it is possible to change human nature. Societies right now are imperfect. Lots of signs of that, right? People cause harm. Wars. Crime. Injustices of a variety of kinds. All of those are examples of imperfections where some people are harmed. But you might say, look, those people aren't just freely choosing to go to war or to commit injustices or to commit crimes. No, instead they're reflecting other underlying forces at the depth level. They're driven by forces that are hidden from them. What could we do to change things, to remove that harm, to make the world a better place? Answer is, according to the neo-gnostic, change the pattern of the forces that are underlying. Make changes at the depth level that will affect the right kinds of changes at the surface level. Well, according to one whole family of this sort of neo-gnosticism, if we change social institutions, we do change the basic levels. We change the basic factors that are controlling how people behave, and so we can remove evils, injustices of a variety of kinds, by changing human nature itself, by manipulating the base level in such a way that people behave differently at the surface level and think of themselves differently at the surface level. We just have to know how. Now this sort of view leads to what I'm calling the hermeneutics of suspicion. The idea is this. If somebody gives you a justification or an explanation uh, or a rationale for how they're acting, should you take that seriously? Well, according to our common sense ways of thinking, of course, somebody's acting this way because they have certain reasons, because they want to achieve a certain goal. But that's not right according to this neo-Gnostic conception. Really, they're acting the way they're acting because of underlying forces that are controlling them. They're not freely acting, certainly not freely acting for the reasons that they give. And so when they give those reasons, should we take them seriously? No, they're just some kind of manifestation of the underlying forces. They don't really reflect the reasons that the person is behaving in the way they do. So what we should do is look at the underlying causes, the material or economic causes in Marx, um, but in Freud, underlying subconscious motivations and so forth. In any case, whatever version of this view you have, you look at the underlying causes. You do not look at the language or uh, reasons that people give. You don't look at the surface level uh, or what the rational agent says he or she is doing at all. Now, of course, that sort of suspicion means you don't take what people say at face value. You reinterpret it. You interpret it as really being about something altogether different from what the person means to be talking about. That does have a number of negative consequences. It poisons the well, to use a traditional term in logic. It makes rational exchange of ideas impossible. It also destroys trust in both directions. Somebody is not going to trust you if you think you aren't taking, if they think that you aren't taking anything they say at face value. Um, it also means that you're not going to trust them because you're going to think everything that they say is really irrelevant. And so it destroys trust in both directions. It polarizes and divides as well. It's us versus them, good versus evil, those who know from those who don't know. Now, it also, you might say, conflicts with certain other aspects of the Enlightenment model. The Enlightenment model of politics makes participation, democracy very important, protects human rights, um, protects human liberties. None of those things really matter on this neo-Gnostic conception. After all, they're at the surface level. If we're not free, then it doesn't matter whether we actually enjoy political liberty or not. Moreover, what's the significance of democracy? Nobody's making choices freely on the basis of what they want for reasons. No, all of that goes out the window. People are simply under the control of various abstract forces or real material um, 
economic forces, or maybe in Freud, subconscious forces, and so on and so forth. So really, we don't have to take any of that very seriously at all. In fact, it leads to a different conception. If some people know what's going on and other people don't, shouldn't the people who know be the ones in charge? Surely, if we are sailing, let's say, and some people actually can navigate and know where we ought to go, and other people don't, we should let those who can navigate steer the ship. Well, similarly, if there are some people who actually know the underlying forces and the way they shape society, then shouldn't we let them be in control? So it leads to a certain view. Put those who know, put the intellectuals, put the elite in charge. Now, what are these intellectuals to do? Here, this vision gets into a little bit of trouble because the idea is supposed to be that we can manipulate the base, the underlying fundamental forces, in order to change the structure of things at the surface, manifest level. But how are we to do that? There's a deep tension at the heart of this picture. Why? Because suppose we say, well, there are certain evils, war, injustice, slavery, crime. We can get rid of those things if we change the structure of society and thereby change human nature, change human behavior. Well, all of that sounds good, but wait a minute, how do we decide what goals are to be achieved and how we're to go about achieving them? How do we assess the endpoints? How do we assess how we get there? There are lots of odds, lots of judgments about what is good and bad, right and wrong, what ought to be done and ought not to be done, that have to come into that picture, that tell us how we ought to shape the base level in order to shape the surface level. And yet notice, those oughts, those shoulds, those right, wrong, good, bad judgments, they have no place at the fundamental level at all. And so we've got to be relying on certain things that actually are undercut completely by this picture because normativity is something that disappears completely at the basic level. So the Gnostic vision relies on norms, otherwise the elite have no idea of what to do once they're in a position of power. But where are those norms going to come from? The whole view is that at the base level those norms don't make any sense at all. Now, let's take a look quickly at the historical background uh, of, of Marxism. This is the revolution of 1848 in Berlin. You can see the German flag in tatters there. This is an artistic rendering, of course, but nevertheless, Europe was in turmoil at the time that Marx developed his theory. The understanding of nature that was revealed in the scientific revolution led to the invention of technologies of all sorts of kinds that transformed human relationships and transformed the economy, for the most part in very good, very beneficial ways. In the 18th century, there was the agricultural revolution, which meant that for the first time, Europe and other developed parts of the world, at any rate, could feed themselves. There was enough food to go around. And so hunger, famine, cycles of prosperity and famine were really things of the past. Secondly, in the 19th century, as we've seen, there's, there was an industrial revolution that helped to make society far more affluent by making it possible to produce goods and ultimately to mass produce goods, which resulted to the benefit of a large number of people. Well, how did this take place? In the agricultural revolution, after 1750, roughly, more food was available. People became much more efficient at growing food. So there was more, more food available at lower prices. That required less labor on the farms to produce. Um, it allowed people to have much more money for other things. It also created surplus labor. It meant lots of people no longer had to be on the farm producing subsistence and, and producing food. Um, it was possible for a relatively small number of people in society to be farming and producing the food. The others had time on their hands. They could do other things. So we had surplus money available for investment. We had surplus labor that was available to work to make those investments pay off. And so the agricultural revolution not only dramatically improved standards of living throughout Europe, but it also meant that there were, were the basic resources, economic resources and human resources, available for the industrial revolution. Let's take a look at one simple element of that, the cotton industry. Edmund Cart Cartwright in, 18, uh, sorry, in, in 1787 invented the power of them. In Great Britain, there were 2,400 of these by 1813. By 1850, there were a quarter of a million. It changed the nature of the production of clothing, of cloth, and so on, of cotton, fundamentally. Before that, a shirt, a pair of pants, that was something that had to be made by hand, spun by hand, actually crafted and sewn by hand. After the invention of the power loom, it was something that could be mass produced. The price of clothing, dropped dramatically. People went from having one or two sets of clothing to having many because it was possible to purchase clothing much less expensively. Well, what happened in the case of food, first in the 18th century and then clothing in the early part of the 19th century, began happening in all sorts of areas of the economy. James Watt, 
in the 1760s invented the steam engine. It became a rotary steam engine with much more power by 1782. In 1800, steam engines were capable of generating 10,000 horsepower. By 1850, 1 1.3 million horsepower. That increase in power fundamentally transformed the way that people were able to do work in all sorts of settings in the economy. Here is Watt's original steam engine as preserved in the British Museum. It's large. As you can see, it would be very hard to use that to go anywhere or do much of anything. But within a short time, the engine became vastly more powerful and much smaller. And so it made possible new, new forms of transportation, railroads, steamships. And correspondingly, there was a need for roads, for canals, for railroads. In 1804, the first locomotive in Britain began to operate. It went five miles an hour. By 1830, it was going 16 miles per hour. By 1850, 50 miles an hour. And there were already 6,000 miles of track just in the United Kingdom alone. Steamships made it possible for international trade to take place much more rapidly and much more reliably than it ever had before. Corresponding to this, there was a tremendous movement of urbanization throughout the early part of the 19th century and continuing through the later part as well. There was a vast movement to, the, to cities. In 1800, London had a million people. Otherwise, there were six cities in Britain between 50 and 100,000. There were no cities at all in between. By 1850, London was a city of 2.4 million. There were nine cities between 100,000 and a million, and 18 between 50 and 100,000. And so people were leaving the countryside where they were no longer needed to produce food and heading toward the cities to work in industrial jobs. Now, the conditions in the cities were often miserable. People were 12 to 16 hour days under very difficult, under not obnoxious, <laughs> um, unpleasant, and often dangerous conditions. There were noxious fumes, there were high temperatures, dangerous conditions in the mills. This was not pleasant work. The cities, with all these people rushing to them, were not very pleasant places. There were a lot of undesirable aspects of the Industrial Revolution. On the other hand, things did, as we'll see great, later, greatly improve. Now, living standards, from one point of view, in these cities were pretty unpleasant. But from another point of view, they were better than anyone had enjoyed since perhaps the Roman Empire. Large numbers of people, for the first time in centuries, had disposable income. Manufacturing greatly increased productivity. It made many more goods available at much lower prices. As supplies increased, prices fell. And so the cost of goods became lower. People could afford to live in ways they could not have afforded before. So here are two images of London that you see, one in 1820, one in 1850. And you can get a sense of the transformation. Already by 1820, people are dressed, or at least some of the people are dressed in fine clothes, others not so much. It's a kind of rowdy, crowded scene. By 1850, you see people dressed up in their Sunday finery. The children are playing a game. They've got toys. Um, other people have fine top hats and so on. Basically, everybody in this lower image looks like the richest people in the top image. And that was something that was taking place, not through all segments of society, certainly, but through many. Many more people had goods, had disposable income uh, than had ever had them before. Increased trade and travel, too, led to vast increases in wealth and income as people were able to take advantage of international commerce in ways they had not before. Now, as I've said, not everything was good. The cities were crowded. There was no plumbing. There was sewage and garbage in the streets. It was in many ways an unsafe, unpleasant, and unhealthy place to be. There was also great income inequality. Uh, the top 1% of people economically in the UK controlled 25% of the national income in 1801. By 1848, 35%. To give you a sort of rough idea of how to compare that with the present, in the United States over the past 20 or 30 years, that percentage has varied between roughly 11 and 19%. And so, we started out the 19th century with already much greater inequality than we have today. By 1848, it was vastly greater than it is today. And here's an image of London in 1850, a slum where people are living in the backyards behind the houses as well as in them. Well, in response to some of the difficulties of these conditions, and also the tremendous social changes that were taking place as a result of industrialization, revolutions broke out throughout Europe in 1848. Most of them didn't really cause any lasting or fundamental changes, but nevertheless, there was a spirit of revolution, a spirit of, uh, of the need for change that was found in lots of different places. 
All of these red dots indicate places where revolution took place throughout the Italian states, throughout the German states, in Denmark, in France, in Ireland, throughout the Austrian Empire. So there were a lot of areas and a lot of um, movements, you might say, responding to unrest as a result of changing social conditions. Well, it was in that context that Karl Marx began to publish his works and began to formulate his theories. Now, in Marx, and by the way, the Communist Manifesto begins by talking about a specter that is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. He was lucky, in a way, <laughs> to be writing in 1848 at a time that all that was going on. That wasn't going on because people read the Communist Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto was published as a way of expressing some of the reasons for this, some of the giving some justifications for it, also um, trying to account for the kinds of conflicts and changes that were going on. Now, in Marxist theory, the base is material. We start with material reality, economic conditions, and he says we use the scientific method. We're talking about real individuals, their activity and the material conditions under which they live. And so his idea is we start with material life, the real material world. The surface is thought, conceiving, thinking, the mental intercourse of men appear at this stage as the direct efflux of their material behavior. So in other words, religion, metaphysics, science, all theory really, is not something that has its own independent reality. The reasons people give in those theoretical terms, they're not the real reasons people are doing what they're doing. The real reasons are entirely economic. They are material. And so thought, ideas, the whole world of ideas is really just a an efflux, as he puts it. It's a superstructure. It is not what is actually doing the causing. Life is not determined by consciousness, he says, but consciousness by life. So the idea is this. Consciousness, ideas, that realm, that's the realm of the surface level. That's where the manifest image is taking place. In the base scientific image, we've got life, we've got material, and in particular economic forces he thinks are important. All the causes are ultimately material and economic. They are not ones at the level of thought. Now, as part of that superstructure, he's hostile to religion. Religion, he says, is the opiate of the masses. But it's not just religion. All theory, all philosophizing, all oughts, all normativity, all of those things are really just effects. As you see, this had practical consequences. It wasn't just a theoretical point. This photograph depicts the destruction of a church on Red Square in Moscow in 1929. Now, morality, religion, metaphysics, all the rest of ideology, those things have no semblance of independence. Um, they really are the results of material production and material intercourse. Now, Engels writes about ethics. Marx himself rarely does. But much later, in the 1880s, Engels was reflecting on ethics and basically said, look, we get our ethical ideas from practical relationships, really from economic relations, uh, the relations that govern production and exchange. All moral theories are simply the product of these economic relations, and so they have no independent significance. Now, of course, that leads us to what I've called the hermeneutics of suspicion, to interpret language or behavior. You don't look at the surface. You look at these underlying economic considerations. So Marxism naturally leads to a cynicism about, or even a hostility toward, not just religion, but morality, any conception of virtue, any conception of ideals. None of those things are what they seem. They are all just fronts for economic self-interest. Now, what is our own essence? What is the essence of a human being? Marx writes, men can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, by religion, or anything else you'd like. What are some things that differentiate us from, our, from animals? We're aware of our own death. Um, we speak. Um, we pray. Um, there are lots of things that might differentiate us from animals. Aristotle says, well, really? Yeah, what is the function of a human being, he asks. A good person is one who fulfills that function well, whatever it is, so it's important to ask what we're for, what our function is. And Aristotle says, well, that's really the question. What is special about people? What differentiates us from animals or other kinds of objects, for that matter, in the world, but especially what makes us different from other animals? His answer is, we act according to rational plans. And so that's his idea. We are distinctly rational and not just capable of thinking, but capable of acting on the basis of our thinking, capable of acting according to rational plans. So in short, we think, we do, we plan. That's what makes us distinctive according to Aristotle. Well, there are lots of other answers you could give. We walk upright. 
we reflect, we speak, we abstract, we theorize, we laugh, we cry, we feel, we pray, we worship. And there are philosophers who have given that answer, one of these answers to this question. So some people have said, yeah, it's really that we laugh, it's that we feel, it's that we abstract, and so on. But now Marx gives a distinctive answer. He says, here's what's distinctive about human beings. We make, we produce things. That's what makes us different from other animals. They themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals, he writes, as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence. And so that's what's really remarkable about us. We make things. We produce things. But of course you can't produce things unless you've got materials to make them from. And so the means of production are required for that. You can't produce, you cannot fulfill your essence unless you've got the means to produce things. So control of the means of production is absolutely central. And this leads Marx to his fundamental distinction between two classes. He says the entire history of the world is a history of class struggle between these two classes, the bourgeoisie, who are defined as the owners of the means of production, here's a stereotypical picture of the bourgeois, and then the proletariat, they're the workers. They do not own the means of production, in fact they lack the means of production themselves, and so here an example of workers in the 19th century. Now, how does one overcome this class struggle? Marx has an analysis that's based on Rousseau's idea that it's really private property that is what divides the bourgeoisie from the proletariat and therefore causes class struggle. Rousseau, in a work called The Discourse on the, in, uh, uh, sorry, on the Origins of Inequality, puts it this way, the true founder of civil society, he says, is the first person to rope off a plot of land, declare this is mine, and find people fool enough to believe him. So that's really how private property gets started. That's how civil society gets started. Rousseau then tells a story of how this leads to greater and greater inequality, until finally, at the end of the story, a few are gorging themselves on luxuries while the multitude lack necessities. Now, that is something that Marx is inspired by. He says precisely, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the bourgeoisie become the masters, the proletariat turn into slaves. They become wage slaves. Yes, they're officially free, they're officially paid, but the fact is they're completely dependent on the owners of the means of production. Well, he comes up with a simple solution. If private property is responsible for the class division that leads to class struggle, here's the answer, abolish private property. Now, he doesn't mean that you would own nothing, not even that pencil or that shirt or something, but he's talking specifically about the means of production. If we abolish private property, then there's no private property. But that means there are no owners. That means there's no bourgeoisie. And that means there's no class struggle. So the idea is really state ownership, collective ownership of the means of production. And that indeed is how we can define communism, which is the view he's arguing for. So what does this mean in practice? Here's the Marxist program as he outlines it in the Communist Manifesto. Progressive income tax meaning the more you earn, not only the more you pay, but the higher the rate you pay. No inheritance, so an estate tax of 100%. Nationalize all banks and have state ownership, not only of finance, but of communication, of transportation, of farms, of factories. In other words, take the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, the revolutions that were coming about in transportation, communication, finance, put the state in charge of all of that, so there are no private owners of the means of production anymore, it is all owned collectively. Well, who's going to work in these things? Well, there will be industrial armies, just as people are drafted and sent to war, so they'll be drafted and sent to factories or sent to farms. And there will be free education, so that the state can prepare people for these various roles. Now, Marx in the German ideology talks about the origins of the state of alienation that he sees as uh, responsible for much of the unhappiness of people in capitalist societies. And he says, ultimately, the problem really stems from division of labor. He says, the division of labor separates my goals from those of others. And so, in particular, my goals from the goals of society as a whole. It leads me to alienation. It leads me to think of my work as an alien force, something that is a stranger to me, something that is no longer an expression of who I am, but instead something imposed upon me. Suppose I'm an artisan who is making something uh, myself as a craftsman. Let's say I'm, I'm working on cabinets. I'm a cabinet maker. Well, then I can see my cabinets as an expression of who I am. But suppose I'm working in a factory that makes cabinets, and my job is, let's say, to just screw in certain screws. Then my activity doesn't seem that closely related to the activity of the whole. Certainly my goal in screwing in those particular screws is not 
uh, is not something that is the goal of the entire factory. Moreover, it looks like what I'm doing is actually pretty insignificant in relation to all of that. I certainly did not craft the entire factory. It is not my goal that has shaped all of that. So of course I'm going to feel alienated from the job that I'm doing. So my own deed becomes an alien power opposed to me. <laughs> well, some jobs are better in this respect, some are worse. But nevertheless, you can see that there is a sort of problem that he's pointing to that results from the division of labor. Well, his idea is that in a capitalist society, you're forced to assume a given role. You've got to be a hunter or a fisherman or a herdsman or a critic or a cabinet maker or a factory worker or a farm worker or something like that. But he says in a communist society, it won't be like that. There won't be the same kind of division of labor. Okay, you can be accomplished in any branch you wish. And so you can hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as you have a mind, without ever actually becoming a hunter, fisherman, or critic. Now, there's something strange about this. Yeah, something very odd about this image. What? Well, one thing is, <laughs> can I just decide tomorrow to become a herdsman, or to become a musician, or to become a lawyer? Well, how would I know what I'm doing, right? So one thing is just, how is this even possible? I mean, we can't all next, the next day just decide to do something different. How will that even take place? How do I decide tomorrow I'm going to be a top flight lawyer in New York? That doesn't seem feasible. Moreover, how is social regulation, how is the organization of a communist society going to have any effect on this at all? Moreover, isn't this a recipe for disaster? Throw me into a law firm and ask me to do something? What am I going to do? I don't know what I'm doing. For that matter, ask me to herd cattle, ask me to fish, ask me to farm. I don't know how to do those things. Neither does the person who says, hey, I think I'll teach philosophy class today, right? How do they know what to do? They don't have the relevant expertise. Isn't this a recipe for just bad philosophy, bad herd herding, bad fishing, bad hunting, bad industrial production, and so forth? How will people have expertise? Moreover, there's something else that should make us suspicious in a fundamental way here. This very example doesn't involve production. Hunting, fishing, herding, those are all things that are involved with pre-industrial stages of society, right? We're talking about hunter-gatherer sort of society. Well, yeah, if you're in a hunter-gatherer side, side of things, you can say, okay, today I'll hunt, tomorrow I'll gather. But industrial societies are not like that. And so there's something very strange about this really being a pre-industrial image in which people are not, in fact, producing. Right? The herdsman is not making anything. The fisherman is not making anything. The hunter is not making anything. And so, really, this example does not fit well at all with this idea that our essence is to make or to produce. Now, Marx does urge revolution. He urges social change. He urges the workers of the world to unite. But that relies on norms. It relies on off-judgments. And so, where do they come from? He does spell out a theory of justice at one point in the critique of the Gotha program. He says, here's my theory of justice from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Now, one problem is obviously, wait a minute, where can you get that? I thought the fun foundational level was really just economic forces, material life. There are no norms in that. And so where do these norms come from? How do we get them out of the base level? But there are other sorts of problems too. For one thing, in this class structure, who is going to take risks? A lot of people have criticized Marx for the adequacy of his account of classes, dividing everybody up into bourgeoisie or proletariat. Now, in fact, I don't think he meant to divide everybody up into those two classes. They were just the two that mattered. There are lots of people in society who don't fit into either one. Artists, professionals of a variety of kinds, um, the clerisy, um, pastors, uh, priests, and so on. Um, so the intellectuals themselves don't really fit in very well. And so there are lots of people who don't fit into this. He thinks they're basically irrelevant to the struggle, however. Um, they might play a role insofar as they ally themselves with the proletariat or with the bourgeoisie, but that's all. Now, there's a more serious problem. If I don't get any reward for excellence, if I don't get any reward for taking risks, why should I take them? It's a lot easier to just sit back and hunt or fish or do whatever than to actually take risks to start a business, to risk my own money or my own time in doing something. Moreover, who determines abilities and needs? Somebody's got to decide what the abilities of people are, what their needs are. Somebody has to decide who gets what and do with the distribution according to this formula. But who will do that? In Russia, they were called the nomenklatura, the people who were in a position of power, as we'll see later. Um, some theorists refer to them as the new class. 
But in any case, there is going to be a class who determines the abilities and needs, and they are going to be put in a very special position. They're going to think pretty highly of their own abilities, and they're going to uh, actually think pretty highly of their own needs, and you might expect that they get a disproportionate amount of the goods to be distributed in this communist society. Moreover, if rewards have no relation to ability to, or to effort, why should I develop my abilities? Why should I exert any effort? After all, from each according to my abilities. So the more I develop my abilities, the more is taken from me. To each according to my needs, what I ought to be doing is developing more needs. And so it looks like the incentives in this system are entirely perverse. They encourage people to develop needs while discouraging them from developing abil abilities and actually exercising them. Now, if that's right, if the Marxist program in the end penalizes people for making and producing, it's a recipe for economic stagnation. But there's something more fundamentally seriously wrong with it from a philosophical point of view. It contradicts what is essential to humanity. The idea here is supposed to be, here's what's essential to us. It's making, it's producing. We are beings that are beings that, yes, think, laugh, cry, feel, do, plan, etc. But most fundamentally, we are beings that make things. We produce things. We are engaged in production. But hold on a second. Production is precisely what gets penalized here. We don't gain anything from producing according to this view. In fact, the more we produce, the more is taken from us. And so you might say, this is a view that really not only does not allow us to express what is most distinctively human, but actively suppresses it and actively contradicts it. Now, according to Marx himself, that's a temporary problem. In fact, all of these are temporary problems. Really, in the end, human nature will change. How? Well, he's vague about this. The state will be transcended. Um, labor will vanish. Okay? Civil society will be replaced by what he refers to as a socialized humanity. But now, how will this take place? I've got to no longer concern myself with my own welfare, my children's welfare, and so on. I've got to be concerned solely with our welfare. Uh, and that means I'm not going to give any pref preference for myself or my own children or my family or my community. I've got to be concerned with everyone equally, which is why Marx thought, by the way, that communism had to be international. The goal is to realize that humanity itself is the goal, not any part of it, not certainly my own individual part. But how do we get there? Can we really produce people who care equally about everyone and don't put themselves in any sense first? Well, that is a traditional ethical ideal. On the other hand, most people think human nature is really incompatible with that ideal. Marx says, don't worry. If we transform society in certain ways, if we make private property no longer a part of the social order, if we nationalize all sorts of things, people will change, what they're concerned with will change, and so the world itself will change. The philosophers, he says, have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. And so in the end, he argues, all of these difficulties depend on a conception of human nature that is relative to our current set of social institutions. If those at that base level are transformed, then who we are itself will be transformed.